around this time, for over 20 years, we gather at, at a spot like this and discuss estate planning issues. But tonight's program is going to be about protecting seniors. Seniors, that means people with gray hair like, like I have, people who are getting on, people who may be thinking about retirement or who are, who are already retired, and may be thinking about what will happen as they slow down, become a little bit frail, maybe a bit vulnerable. So that's what tonight's program is about. So let me start with my part of the program and it's about powers of attorney. You may have read that as of October 1st, we have a new power of attorney law. And I think it's important for all of you to understand that some of the changes that are made by this law can have a big impact on how you prepare your powers of attorney, but also if you're, an, if you're named as an agent under a power of attorney, you need to understand how the law will affect, affect you, whether it creates any new exposures, whether it creates any new duties, and it does. But let's first talk about what is a power of attorney. It's, it's actually a simple, a very simple idea, and that's been part of its appeal. The power of attorney is just a written document. I'll, I wanted to put this in the context of an actual example. So the example I'll use is Gramps, and just pretend I'm Gramps. I'm Gramps, and I want to appoint somebody as my agent, and I'll say, I'm gonna appoint my grandson. His name is Sonny. So I wanna appoint Sonny as the agent under my power of attorney. And all that means is, I want Sonny to be able to help me. I want, if, if I'm unable to go to the bank and pay the bills, or to call the broker and, and ask him to execute a, a sale. If I'm not able to do that for one reason or another, I want to appoint Sonny to do it for me. So I'm the guy who's making the power of attorney. I'm called the principal. Sonny is the one I'm gi giving authority to. He's called the agent. And so then I get sick. So that's what a power of attorney does. It's, all it does is, is authorize Sonny to act for me. And it can either be a very broad authorization or it can be narrow. Now I'm talking about broad authorizations that people typically use for estate planning purposes. So I give Sonny this broad authorization to, to help me and that's called the power of attorney. And then I get sick. And Sonny takes out the power of attorney and he sees that he's got all these powers and he thinks, great, now's my opportunity to help Gramps. So he says, well, I know Gramps needs to have his bills paid. I'll go down to the bank and set things up at the bank so that I can write checks on his account. Just make sure his bills are paid. So Sonny does that. And this is where it starts getting interesting. Where the, the question is, when Sonny does that, when he accepts the power of attorney, what changes? What new relationships are created? And the new power of attorney law is designed to better define my relationship, Gramps' relationship with Sonny and with the bank. So it's meant to better define the relationship between principal, agent, and third party. So when Sonny goes and he, he goes to the bank and um, sets things up to the bank, he's accepting the power of attorney. Now I'll get, in a little bit, I'll get to how many different ways there are to accept a power of attorney. But this is one of the ways. He goes to the bank and he says, I want to help out Gramps. Here's the power of attorney. That's an acceptance of the power of attorney. And when he accepts that, the power of attorney in that way, it brings into effect a whole list of duties that apply to him. And see, you see the list of duties here. When he acts according to this list of duties, He's got to act in accordance with Gramps's, that's my reasonable expectations. And he's got a duty to try to figure out what my reasonable expectations are. That's a little bit different from the old law. So that's new. 
the duty to determine what my reasonable expectations are. And if they can't be determined, then he's got the duty in, in, in performing an acts under the power of attorney, he's got the duty to figure out what my best interests are. But first rule is figure out what my personal expectations are. Then he's got to act in good faith. So when Sonny is doing something for me under the power of attorney, Sonny has to behave in good faith. That means honesty in fact. What does honesty in fact mean? I tried to look it up. The only place I could find where honesty in fact is used is in the commercial, uh, Uniform Commercial Code. I might, you know, I didn't look that long, so. But the point is, that that's, an, that's an interesting um, duty to act in good faith. It implies we know what it means. And, and I think in, in, for some what it means, they, they define it this way, pure heart, empty head. It doesn't mean it doesn't mean you have to go out and um, get all the facts. All you need is a pure heart. That's one definition of good faith. And, and one, one issue is whether that's the definition that applies when an agent is performing under a power of attorney. Then the other duty is to act within the scope of authority. So when Sonny takes the power of attorney down to the bank, he should be able to appoint to a specific provision in the power of attorney that says banking transactions. So he knows, he knows that's within his scope of authority. So that's one of the duties, to act within the scope of authority. And then, so, so the duties above the highlighted areas, those are ones that can't be waived, can't be excluded, they're mandatory, they're the minimum standards. The highlighted duties are duties that Sonny will have unless the document specifically excludes them. So let's say I just give Sonny the power of attorney and it's very broad, it does not exclude any of these highlighted items. That means he's got all those duties. He's got the duty to act with loyalty in my best interests. He's got the duty to avoid conflicts. He's got the duty to use ordinary care competence and diligence. We've got the duty to keep good records. Now, these bottom two are kind of new. Everything I've mentioned so far is pretty close to the way it's been in the past. There are some nuances of differences, but pretty close to our general understanding of the duties an agent would have already. But the, the last two listed there, the duty to cooperate with the healthcare representative, well, that's understandable, but back when the old statute was written, we, I don't think we had a thing called health care representative, so it makes sense to include it in the new law. The last one is the one that causes me the most worry, and that's the duty to, Sonny, Sonny, my agent, would have the duty to attempt to preserve my estate plan. And that's the one I worry about. Do we really know what that means? Do we know, you know, the parameters of that duty? And when Sonny goes down to the bank to set up the bank account, you know, set the Gramps' bank account up so that he can write checks on it, does he have any inkling that somehow he's got some responsibility for Gramps' estate plan? And I think maybe that he doesn't. And I think that that can be a problem because well, first of all, it's really easy to accept a power of attorney. I mentioned his just going down to the bank. Is action enough to accept a power of attorney? Which means to bring in all those duties that, that, that were listed before. That's enough. Even accepting, even doing a very narrow act, the way the act is, the way the, um, the law is written, just performing a very narrow act means you've accepted the power of attorney. It doesn't say power of attorney with respect to that particular act. It says the power of attorney as a whole. So he's, he's by doing that narrow act, he's accepting duties, according to the law, duties that are much broader than anything he ever imagined. And how does he accept? Well, one way is doing, exercising any authority granted to him under the power of attorney. So going to the bank would be an acceptance. 
performing any type of duty as an agent or any other assertion or conduct indicating acceptance. So we have lots of clients. They sign powers of attorney, they name a child, and they want to give the child a copy of the power of attorney so that he can have it and use it. It seems to me that might be an acceptance. He hasn't really done anything with it yet, but he's holding it. I think that could probably be construed as an acceptance. When he accepts that, is he also accepting this duty to, don't forget how it's phrased, to try to preserve the estate plan? So it doesn't mean he has to preserve the estate plan, it just means he has to try. So why is this important to Sonny? Well, I think any time you have a duty, if you breach a duty and there's damages, there's usually consequences. And the act provides that if an agent re, um, breaches a duty and it results in a decrease in the value of the property of the principal, then the remedy is restoration of value of the principal's property. So here's an example of, of a situation I think that might be difficult. Let's say I'm Gramps, I have two accounts. One is a $100,000 account that's payable on death to George. I have another $100,000 account that's payable on death to Harry. Beneficiary, there are beneficiary designations for these accounts. Presumably, that could be interpreted as part of an estate plan. It's disposition of assets at death, okay? Now, I'm Sonny, no, I'm not Sonny. Sonny's over there, I'm sick. Sonny takes my assets from account A that's payable to George and uses them to pay my bills. He's not thinking about beneficiary. He doesn't even know these accounts have beneficiaries. He just pays all my bills from account A. So now when I, when I die, George, let's say he's paid $50,000 in expenses. George now gets 50,000 instead of 100, where Harry gets 100. George is upset. Why, you know, why'd you take it all from my account? Is George's attitude. Does George have a remedy? George, very possibly, is the way I'm reading the new act, could go to Sonny and say, you had a responsibility to pre preserve Gramps' estate plan. You owe me some money. I would have gotten more if you had paid attention because you owe a duty of restoration. That's what I'm worried about, about the new, new act. And the probate court is now given very broad, much broader powers than it's ever had before to impose orders to deal with this liability for breach. Now, Sonny might feel some comfort in all of this by saying, well, I acted in good faith. I had a pure heart. The whole time I had a pure heart. I didn't have a bad motive. I didn't do anything wrong. I just didn't know that the, the beneficiaries were the way they were. And so that's a defense. But I think Tim would tell you, Tim who's gonna talk about litigation issues later, he'll probably tell you that if I can see a cause of action against, against Sonny here, and I'm not a litigator, I bet a litigator's gonna see it too and try to take advantage of it. And then, what, what is Sonny left, left with? A defense. I have a defense. It's good faith, I acted in good faith. Well. Guess what that means? He's got to spend a lot of money defending it. He's going to need Tim to, to, to help him out in the defense. There's going to be court proceedings and papers filed. It can be expensive. So that, to me, is kind of a problem for Sonny. I want to, when I do a power of attorney for Gramps, I want to protect Sonny from that situation. Sonny, and by that I mean, when I prepare the power of attorney, I could put in a provision that exonerates Sonny unless, unless he's acting dishonestly with an improper motive or reckless indifference to the purposes of the power of attorney. So we can put in these exoneration provisions to make sure that Sonny's gonna be protected.
So I want, I, so one of, my, one of my goals tonight is to make sure that you're aware that when you appoint somebody in a power of attorney, if you don't think about these things that you can do to protect the agent from inadvertent breaches of duty, you want to you want to think about maybe excluding some of the the optional duties because you can. You want to think about you know perhaps exonerating your agent to the extent you can. Now some some people might say, well, doesn't that just open Sonny up? He's more likely to abuse it then. I mean, there's no standards. So the, the way I feel, the way I've always felt about powers of attorney is you never appoint anybody you have the slightest doubt about. If you have any doubt about them at all, you don't appoint them. And I, we drill this into our clients, and I think it's one reason why I can't think of a single client that we've had where, the, where we know about a, a power of attorney being abused. We get, these, we get these things in the office where you know, somehow or other, people have gotten their hands on powers of attorney some other way. But we drill it into clients, you don't appoint anybody you have the slightest doubt about. And that means, that means if you think the client or the agent would be improperly influenced by a spouse, don't, don't appoint that person. If you think that person might be tempted because they've got a gambling habit or some other things like that, you, you just don't do it. It's too powerful a document. We want to make the documents unconditional. We don't like to put a lot of conditions on them because if there's conditions, that makes them harder to use. Now what's happened with the new law, and you'll see, is in order to try to prevent abuse, they've imposed some, some duties for sure, but now I'm gonna get to some other conditions that, that the things, things that amount to conditions that will make it harder to use. So anyway, Sonny's gone down to the bank and he thinks it's gonna be an easy process. He'll just look, here's the power of attorney and Mr. Banker set it up so I can write checks on Gramps' account. Uh, and now there's a few things that could happen. The bank might say, yeah, Sonny, I, I've known you for years and I know Gramps, I know he trusted you and this all looks fine to me, that could happen. And once upon a time when, when banks were hometown banks and people knew each other better, that was much more likely to happen. Now, um, another thing might happen. That other thing might happen, the banker might say, I don't know. You know, I've, I'm a little bit, I think this little, feels a little sketchy to me, I don't know. I don't know if I want to honor this power of attorney. Under the old law, there was no provision that said the bank had to honor the power of attorney. Now, under the new law, the bank might be obligated to uh, honor the power of attorney, but only under certain circumstances. First of all, under the new law, the bank is protected if it acts in good faith and has no knowledge that the power of attorney is void or invalid or terminated and has no knowledge that the agent's exceeding his authority. Now, I, think I don't think that gives bankers much comfort because if they were criticized, it's, it's, kind of hard, it's kind of hard to prove no knowledge. Proving a negative is hard. So I can understand why they, maybe they don't feel that's, that's a whole lot of protection. So when some negotiations were going on about uh, what the new law should provide and what kind of duty should be imposed on third parties to accept powers of attorney, they came up with this procedure. And the procedure is that the, the bank or any third party is required to accept the power of attorney within seven days, except if that third party, a bank, requests that the agent sign a certification under penalties of perjury regarding the facts that the bank thinks are relevant. And if the bank requests a legal opinion, then with the bank, within five days after receiving those certifications and opinion, must honor the power of attorney. Okay, but that's, you know, that's, okay, seven days goes by, they make the request, 
then people have to do something, a certification and a legal opinion, that might make take time. It goes to the bank, the bank has another five days, that's more time. There's no guarantee that the certification or the opinion is gonna be exactly what the bank wants to see. There's no guarantee that the lawyer will get the legal opinion done very quickly. So I'm a little bit worried that the power of attorney, which was supposed to be, you know, it's, the appeal of the power of attorney is that it's convenient, it's accessible, it's easy to use, it's inexpensive, it's prompt. That's been the appeal. That's why, it, that's why maybe everybody in this room has done something like that. And it's been, it's been one, one of its selling features has been that if you do a power of attorney, then maybe you won't need a conservatorship. You won't need to go to the probate court to get somebody appointed to get things done someday. That's one of the, the appeals of the power of attorney, but I'm a little bit afraid that these, this, this process that could take 12 days or more um, might throw a monkey wrench into that whole, whole system. And I'm a little bit afraid that because of that, you're gonna see conservatorship applications go up in the probate court or another, another tool that's often used to deal with with managing assets in the event of incapacity that would avoid conservatorships would be revocable trust. And we don't have enough time to go into revocable trust, but if you go see some of our estate planning videos on YouTube, there's a lot in there about it. So that's, that's the new law. If the bank or third party, I don't, I know I'm not trying to pick on banks. Um, I, it's just so often the case that clients are taking powers of attorneys to the bank. And they're the most frequently the third party we're talking about. But if those, if those certifications don't come in, then the bank has no duty, no requirement to honor the power of attorney. And then what do you do? Well, you go to the probate court. And the probate court has been given some additional powers to deal with these types of situations. Now, there's a whole lot more I wanted to talk about. Be careful about powers of attorney. Now, I have to, it is my duty and my honor and my pleasure to introduce to you Allison Marcusio.